In this video, we're going to be taking a look at two topics, 4.2 and 4.3, soil formation and erosion, and soil composition and properties. Whatever you prefer to call it, soil is an important and often overlooked and taken for granted natural resource. Soil not only provides a habitat for a variety of bacteria, fungi, and animals, it is also the substrate in which plants establish their roots and obtain water and nutrients. The process of soil formation is a slow one. It involves both chemical and physical processes and occurs abiotically and biotically. Before we explore the processes and mechanisms that produce soil, let's first answer the question, what is it? Soil is an aggregate of five components. In any given soil sample, you would find living things, organic material, water, air, and minerals. Living things make up the tiniest fraction of soil. In it, we would find microorganisms like bacteria, including those that convert nitrogen gas into usable forms for plants. We would also find numerous small invertebrates, insects, and the roots of plants. The next smallest fraction, organic material, includes the remains of once living organisms at various stages of decay. Water and air combined comprise about half of a typical soil sample. Both are found in the pockets and small spaces in between the solid materials that make up soil. Finally, the mineral component of soil makes up nearly half of a soil sample. This category includes both the actual minerals released from the weathering of rock, like magnesium, potassium, and aluminum, but also the broken down rock from which it came, like gravel and sand. Soil formation is influenced by five factors. The first is the parent material that will ultimately provide the inorganic minerals present in soil, and is actually just rock. All three types of rock, igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary, can serve as the basis for soil formation. However, the physical properties of different types of rock influence the rate at which it breaks down. Igneous rock, for example, tends to break down more slowly than metamorphic and especially sedimentary rock. Soil formation is also influenced by the topography of the land. In places with steeper inclines, rock tends to be broken down more quickly since it's more likely that wind, the flow of water, and animal activity will cause it to fall and break into smaller pieces. The presence and quantity of organisms that participate in the decomposition of rock is another variable in soil formation. The type of climate also plays a role in soils formation. The breakdown of rock typically increases as temperatures rise and there's more precipitation, which means that rock found in hot and wet climates tend to break down faster than those in cold, dry places. Also. Repeated cycles of heating and cooling cause the expansion and contraction of rock and may ultimately lead to its fracturing. The final and probably most obvious variable is time. Quite simply, it takes time for all of the processes involved to form soil. All types of rock are subjected to the same physical and chemical weathering processes that break them down. Physical processes are driven mainly by wind and water. Blowing winds can pick up small pebbles and sand that can erode the surfaces upon broken rock, wearing them down. The flow of water, as in a river, can accomplish the same task, slowly eating away at the rock and carving a pathway downhill. In a process called ice fracturing, Water can also enter cracks in rocks where, if it freezes, can slowly enlarge that crack over time since water expands as it freezes. The roots of plants, as they grow, also have the power over long periods of time to work their way into cracks in rocks, wedging them open. Chemical processes are also important in the formation of soil. 
Most precipitation is slightly acidic and therefore can dissolve rock, but does so slowly over long periods of time. Certain elements in rock, like iron and aluminum, react with oxygen in the atmosphere. And then, of course, there's the action of bacteria and mosses and lichens growing on rock and slowly breaking it down thanks to the substances that they produce and secrete. Once parent rock material has been weathered enough into small enough pieces, it is transported via erosion by wind and water. As we can see in this satellite image, weathered rock in the form of sand and sediment is being carried down the Connecticut River and deposited into Long Island Sound. As anyone who's ever dug a hole can tell you, as you go deeper into the ground, you find that the material present has different characteristics and different properties. These are referred to as soil horizons, and each layer has its own unique features, such as texture and composition. The uppermost layer, called the O horizon, is where we would find plant litter, like dead leaves, where the decomposition process is just beginning. The bottommost portion of the O horizon is where we would be likely to find a material called humus, which is an organic-rich component of soil formed as the decomposition process begins. The A horizon is the layer that contains the most organic material and living things. In certain environments, depending upon precipitation and the amount of water that infiltrates the ground, as well as the age of the soil, the E horizon may exist. This horizon forms as water picks up minerals and carries them to deeper layers as the water percolates down they tend to accumulate in the next layer down, the B horizon. This layer typically has much less organic material than layers closer to the surface, and is as generally as deep as plant roots would grow. The first layer beneath the soil horizons is the C horizon. Here, we typically find that there's no organic material, but there is rock in the earliest stages of weathering and breakdown. The material here closely resembles the parent material in the bedrock beneath it. Because not all soils are equally suitable for various purposes, a soil's texture can be determined to assess its usefulness for things such as agriculture and development. The texture of soil is due to the sand, silt, and clay within it. Particles of sand are the largest, clay particles are the smallest, and silt particles are sized right in between them. A soil type can be classified by quantifying the proportions of each of those components and then using the soil triangle. For example, if a soil sample was determined to include 20% sand, 20% clay, and 60% silt, that soil would be classified as silty loam. In another example, if a different sample contains 35% sand, 30% clay, and 35% silt, that soil would be identified as clay loam. For the best growth of plants in agricultural purposes, the most effective classification of soil is loam. That kind of soil has the best properties for water infiltration and percolation, as well as for the growth of plants' roots. How easily water can infiltrate into soil and then travel through it describes properties of soil called permeability and porosity. The spaces between solid particles in soil reference that soil's porosity. Those pore spaces, if they exist and in what sizes, influence how much water that soil type can retain. Soils that are porous also tend to allow for greater ease of water flowing through them. Additionally, when pore spaces are connected, that allows for even faster groundwater flow. Soil with no pore space is non-porous and non-permeable to water. If pore spaces are present but are unconnected, that soil is porous but non-permeable. And soils that have connected pore spaces are both porous and permeable. 
Since soil is the substrate in which most food is produced, testing and evaluating soil is an important part of a process to determine its usefulness. An important part of agriculture involves determining what nutrients are present in relatively high concentrations and which ones are present in relatively low concentrations. This allows farmers to apply the appropriate type and concentration of fertilizer necessary to grow their crops. Also, soil is tested for its water holding capacity as well as how much water runs off on the surface and how much actually soaks into the ground. Knowing that makes for the utilization of appropriate irrigation techniques and helps to avoid wasteful water usage. Finally, as we saw in an earlier presentation on ecosystem services, as water travels through soil, microorganisms within it work to detoxify that water. Various species of bacteria and fungi take in potentially toxic compounds and metabolize them to release ones that are fairly innocuous. Even plants can remove potentially harmful substances from water by taking them in through their root system. The porosity and permeability of soil is a variable in how effective soil's filtering mechanism is. Those soils with low porosity and permeability don't allow water to flow through them very well, preventing the water from being filtered. On the other hand, if soil is too porous and permeable, water flows through it too quickly and there simply isn't enough time for filtering actions and metabolic processes to take place. And that will close out our look at soil, its formation and properties. Thank you and take care.